Let's use this terrible economic crisis to question assumptions behind economic theory and to rethink the role of the state, finance and austerity in promoting growth and innovation. Often they are seen as, uh, as opposing forces in a way. The private sector is very, very innovative and the state is sort of on the way if, and then that, that it has to get away from the private sector to, to do, the, do its job. But, but I think the, the real uh, life experience tells us that they're actually much more complementing each other. So the public sector is, when it's good in, in, in sort of supporting innovation, it's not replacing the private sector, but it's in many ways either leading the private sector to new opportunities, you know, opening up the new, new opportunities, or it's itself is investing a lot of money into private opportunities, private sector, also, but also into people, for instance. So in that sense, I think the key here, here is to, to, to see that the, that the state is in many ways complementing, and that is the key role of the state, is to complement the private sector. And this is also in many ways in the positive aspects, to lead, to show the new ways in a way, if you will, but also in negative aspects, in the sort of to, for instance, if you think about environment, I mean, obviously the private sector is never going to sort of clean up if you just leave it, leave it to freedom to do whatever it wants. So the, the state has to role also in terms of dealing with the negative consequences of the innovation. So again, it's complementing what the private sector perhaps cannot do and, and indeed because of the coordination problems and whatnot. So I think the state has an enormously important role, and, but it doesn't need to copy, it doesn't need to behave as, as if it were a private sector, but it needs to find its own way of behaving, own, behave, own way of of, of defining the issues actually, what are the state issues and what are the private sector issues and I think this is really important for the state to understand or the bureaucrats. If you look over the last 30 years almost you have this sort of tendency to, to make the public sector to perform as, it were, as if it were on the marketplace so to have the same, same kind type of incentives. I mean we used to call it new public management, now we call it performance management. And I think it's, uh, it's fundamentally wrong to, uh, to again, view the, the state as if, as if it were a private sector or as if it were operating in the, in the marketplace because the state is not operating in the same incentive structures as the private sector is because the state, the bureaucrats, the, bureaucrats, the civil servants, they have to have a much wider picture in mind, which, in mind, which usually tends to be also much more long term has to deal with not only the very sexy issues of the current whatever iPhone or whatever you want to have, but also very complicated issues of poverty allevi alleviation, of, of uh, environmental issues and all that. So I think that uh, we cannot really uh, and we shouldn't use the same type of performance management ideas or, or looking at the performance as we do in the private sector. I mean the state has a very different agenda. The state has to be very different. Doesn't, ne doesn't mean it has to be boring in that sense doesn't mean it has to be bad or weak. No, on, quite on the contrary. The state has a, and should have a very strong, it's powerful identity of, of what it does. I think that the very well-performing states, or good-performing states, are actually not really very exciting, but they have the tendency to have the ability to look at the long-term issues and to, in a way, stay above of the social sort of fights, if you will, or political fights. So the, I think that it's always about competences. For one thing, I would say that you always want to have very competent people. So you always have to go for very well educated people in different fields. You need anthropologists, engineers, public management, mm -hmm. edu e econ economics. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I think that is very important for, this, for the state to, do, to, to, to act well in a way is, is to, to act as a countervailing power. I mean, the, the Calratian term of, of, of not only sort of following whatever is the hip and cool and fashionable today, but really also going against the current and thinking what do we have to be in 10, 20 years, 30 years, and again if we go to the, uh, to the often very difficult issues of climate change, for instance, that is we cannot solve in two years, for instance, but the next elections are the two in two years or three years, so you always have to take that into account. But uh, if, you, if, if you sort of look at the state as, as a countervailing power also in many ways uh, for the economy or against the economic interest, against social in interest, so again you get a separate ethos or separate ethics in the state. So the autonomy of the state in that sense, as the Peter Evans is very famous term. Yes. And now turning on to East Asia, th there's one basic and really important background point um, I want to make that I think 
both the um, the orthodox narrative and the heterodox narrative miss. And that basic point is that the historical record shows that economic development is really, really difficult. And the central piece of evidence is this. Ask yourself how many uh, non-Western countries have become developed countries over the past 200 years. So not since the Second World War.